Hey everybody, this is Nicole Pascal with Topaz Labs. Thanks for joining us here today. I am super excited to welcome back John Barclay, our Topaz user pro and friend. Hey John. How, how are you today? Thanks I'm for having me back. Good. You're, yes, absolutely. You're always welcome. Um, today, John is going to be our first pro to feature the new black and white effects and show us how he is using it in his workflow and how he's applying it to his images to create unique black and whites. So let me tell you a little bit about John first, give you a little technical information about the webinar itself, and then I'll turn it over to him. John is an award-winning freelance photographer. He's based out of Bucks. County, Pennsylvania, and he is a pretty busy workshop leader as well. He's also an inspirational speaker and has been presenting his program Dream, Believe, Create to audiences around the country. Also his blog, Dream, Cre uh, Believe, Create, is pretty fun too to, uh, to follow along with. Um, his work has been published in all sorts of magazines and books, and recently John was the recipient of an excellence award from Black and White Magazine. So let's go ahead and tell you a couple technical things real quick. If you're having any trouble with your screen or the sound, usually logging off and logging back in will help, especially if you shut down anything that might be running flash or anything that might be taking up a lot of memory on your system. Also, if you have any questions during uh, John's presentation, there is a questions module on your GoToWebinar panel. Myself and Ashley Robinson, our product manager, will be answering those as quickly as we can. And then John's going to be taking some questions during the Q&A session after the presentation. So with that, I will go ahead and give it over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And again, thanks for having me back. I, I enjoy working with Topaz and with you, and I appreciate, again, the team allowing me the opportunity to talk about what I think is a home run of a piece of software. This is really great fun, and uh, just a quick story to start. When I was first started working with this, I, I thought I'd send an image to Nicole, and by the end of the day, I think I'd sent her like 30. I just couldn't <laughs> stop. It was really addictive, good fun. So with that, let's get started, and you've probably seen this first image because uh, the folks were kind enough to use this image uh, in some of their advertising for the new product. And we'll use this to first get started with the interface itself and uh, give you a tour of that if you're not familiar. And even if you are familiar, I think we should take a minute to do that. So we'll go down to Topaz Labs here in our filters, from our filter menu, and go to black and white effects. And here we are in a very familiar interface, or at least it should be if you have other uh, products from Topaz. And on the left-hand side, we have presets. And we can scroll over these presets and get a, a quick idea in the top left-hand corner of the screen as to what they might look like. And then we can go over to the right-hand side where we'll spend a little bit more time and as uh, when I either teach in a workshop or on these webinars or my own personal podcast, you'll learn pretty quickly that I like to learn what's going on in the right side because that's where I think where most of the magic can come and where you can start to create your own unique uh, images and craft them to be what you would like them to be. And certainly Topaz gives us a lot of control on the right hand side as we go through this. So let's just do that. We can come over here and very quickly go to, let's say, the traditional collection, go down to something like classic, um, and you can see very quickly they've given you the ability to one click and get a look, uh, a very nice look, very quickly uh, and easily and, you know, cool tone if you want that, and it takes a second to render, and I just reminded myself that I need to slow down a little bit because the screen through the webinar is a little slower. It's nice and snappy for me, but it'll be slower for you, and there's a cool tone, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll start with a cool tone here just for fun, and over here under con on the conversion, which is the first flyout tab that comes down, and you if you hit that triangle, it'll, it'll show you what's being done. And the ones that have checks in them now are the ones that are being used by that preset. Uh, and if you undo that, it'll take away that effect. So if we go and then roll that uh, triangle down again, we can see that under basic ex exposure, we have some basic tools, with contrast, and these are, these are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. You have some brightness adjustments and contrast adjustments. 
But most importantly, this boost the black and the boost the white becomes important for a number of images, and you should certainly play with those to see what that does. That it's going to do just what it says. It's going to boost the lighter tones closer to white or boost, boost those blacker tones closer to black. The reason that becomes important in black and white photography is having a really strong black and white point is what creates a fair amount of contrast or more contrast and becomes much more appealing typically in, in a black and white image. And then when we go down to adaptive exposure, we have our old friend here, which we would, if we've used uh, Topaz Adjust, here it is in this particular piece of software. So this adaptive exposure and regions works exactly like it does in Adjust. So the adaptive exposure is like a, an auto adjust button on steroids, I like to say. It goes from one to 100, if you will, and, and makes an adjustment on that image and then the region slider says to that adaptive exposure slider, what region of that image do you want to adjust with the slider? So the further to the left, it's just adjusting the outside regions, if you will, or the real light, light tones and the black, black tones. The more we go towards the middle, it's now affecting more of the tones towards the middle, right, uh, of, of the scale of, from 0 to 255. And now it's affecting all of those tones if we go way over to the right. And so we have an awful lot of control to do some adjustments within that, uh, within black and white effects to the exposure or to the look that we're trying to craft here with our old friend, essentially Topaz Adjust right from within here. And then protect highlight shadows are pretty self-explanatory. And then here we are again with the ability to add detail. And by sliding this over, we can add detail to the image and boost to, uh, to that, which is a more localized uh, detail adjustment. And then we'll roll down here to color sensitivity. And it start, this is where it starts to get to be kind of fun. What we have here, different than a color filter, which we'll cover next, is these sliders adjust the brightness and the darkness of that particular tone. And so this is pretty dramatic. If we go here, we're now brightening up the red tones that are in that image or darkening up the red tones in that image. So we'll leave those a little brighter here. The yellow, we could do the same. We could brighten or darken. Yeah, let's go down to the blue because that has the sky, and we can start to darken that sky. And I, these are nice, subtle, fine-tuning adjustments that you can use. And this is, this is an area that is, was very exciting to me to find that they had added because it's a little different than the color filter, which we'll roll that open. The color filter is much like using a filter, a piece of glass that you would put in front of uh, your lens. And typically, we, you know, we've had yellow and orange and red and green and blue filters. But what you have here is the whole color spectrum that you can use. And the difference here is it affects complementary colors. So if you go to blue, it's going to affect yellow as well. Make one darker and one lighter. So you can make this stronger and get uh, the effect. Let's go over to red to give you a slightly different look. And you can start to adjust the image again with this particular tool in a different way than you can with the color sensitivity. And, and this will act more like as if you were putting a filter in front of the uh, front of the lens. And again, you can always turn these things off if you want to by checking uh, the, or taking off the checkbox and seeing turning it off to get a before and after preview if you want to see what's going on with it as well. Moving on down here, we have some creative effects. The big one that I really like is this diffusion. So if I click that button. Hopefully you'll see that that has now affected the image and given it a wonderful diffused glow look. I love this, and it's what I used on this particular image that I submitted for them to use. And then if we roll that open, we have some adjustments to that particular effect. So we can dial that softness down just a little bit if we want to. We can dial the diffusion down if we want to and like make it a little more subtle if we want to, and then the transition between between those, we can adjust that as well. <clears throat> and then we have other things like our old friend, Topaz Simplify. So if we wanted to simplify the image and make it a more artsy looking for an artistic effect, we can do that. And again, we can turn that off if we want to. Posterize, we can do that. Camera shake is kind of a unique uh, capability and uh, gives you kind of a, an old camera shake look. That's another choice you can make. 
And then let's roll down to local adjustments. Now this is a big deal. If we don't like how dark something is or light something in the, is in the image, we can adjust that. So before I show you that, let me just roll down one more uh, and go to finishing touches and we'll come back to that local adjustments here in a second. Again, remember everything that's clicked or checked rather here is it's checked because it's being used by the preset over on the left side. Uh, and so we can take that off. We can say, hey, I, I don't want the film grain and I can take that out, which I'll do here. Uh, and in this case, I can take the border out if I want to or add the border back in. And here's a fun one that I definitely want you to learn about today, and I'll use it again. But the transparency one allows you to, when we open this up, to bring back some of the color. So I'll bring it all the way over. I think that's really a lot of fun. I've, I've used this a lot already. So we can bring back some of the color and blend it in with the black and white work that we're doing and create yet another choice and another processing uh, choice that we have. <clears throat> so now let me go backwards just a second to the local adjustments. And here's how those work. So we can dodge, burn, or add color. Those are the choices that we can do with the adjustment. And here's our strength of how much we're going to affect that adjustment. And then we can have the brush size. But the brush size can be made bigger or smaller with our typical bracket keys next to the letter P. So you can use those just as we would in Photoshop to do that. Or you can use the slider should you want to use the slider to make it bigger or smaller. And then there's an opacity slider. You can change the hardness of that brush or the softness or the feathered nature of that brush. And then the edge aware has to do with how good of a job it's going to do finding the edge of that particular area that you're selecting to do some uh, lightening or brightening. So let's just go to this tree real quick and we should be able to just paint on here and brighten that tree up just a little bit. And I'm not sure how that's going to transfer or over to the webinar. Sometimes it doesn't show up. I'll paint yet again. I know what I'll do. We'll make this go, the overall strength, a little brighter, and you should be able to see it. Hopefully you see that enough. You can see it definitely in the mask down here. It's doing a very good job of just selecting the tree and making that area brighter but a pretty powerful tool to have in there for crafting your image beyond just the preset uh, that they're giving you to work with. So that's a, a quick introduction to the tools that are available. Now let's go look at a few images here and start applying some of these things and showing you maybe how you can apply these to your own images. So we'll get rid of that. Let's head on, head on that, by the way, that last image was in the Palouse. Now let's head to Tuscany for fun. I had the pleasure of being with my tour partner, Dan Sniffen, and I uh, led a tour over uh, in Tuscany. And it was my first time being over there. I can't wait to go back again. It was really spectacular. So let's go back in to here. And let's go explore a little bit. So we can go into the classic looks and very quickly get something that looks pretty darn good right out of the box. And, by, and here we can go to stylized collections. And for instance, we can go to that diffusion filter that I told you about that I like so much. And there it is built right into a preset effect. We can go to adaptive diffusion, which is uh, with color, which basically that's adding in that transparency that we just spoke about. Uh, and a whole bunch of other, I think there's and Nicole, maybe you can help me here. Is there 150 or 200 now presets at this point? There are 175 in, in this version, and then we have more coming at you, so yeah. <laughs> which will make Lots it above 200. Yeah. yeah, and I suspect users are going to end up creating some effects and sending them in because it really becomes an awful lot of fun to play with this. But let's go ahead and go back to the traditional collection on this one. And let's scroll down here to Warm Tone 1. And then we're going to come over here and, and just kind of walk through how I would use this um, to further craft the image to be what I want. I, I see a little bit more grain in there than I would like. So I'm going to come down to the finishing touches where the grain exists. And I'll click that off. And I think you'll notice that it took out that graininess in the sky specifically. It wasn't a look that I particularly cared for. And then on this one, I would also come to the finishing touches and make a choice for a border. 
And by the way, right now the borders are black and white, but I'm told that uh, in a future version that they're going to be adding a number of other more maybe I would call them organic type borders. So you have that to look forward to and remember upgrades or updates to um, their software is always free. So that's good. And as they come out with these new enhancements uh, to the product, you'll automatically get those. And then in this particular image, I really love this transparency. And I would just slide this over and add a little bit of that color back in. And voila, we're done. Just that fast, we've created something that's very pleasing. And that's what I wanted to show off of that first image is just how simple and easy it is uh, to create something that looks very appealing very quickly. OK, let's go over to our next image. Get my notes over here so I can read them. So you might be asking, so how good is it with people pictures? You know, you showed us some landscape things. How about people pictures? OK, so here's a little friend, a friend of mine's daughter, Marley. I'll come back down. Whoops. Let's take a look at Marley. I think this looks wonderful just as a classic conversion with one click. It's that wonderful, that fast. Um, but let's play a little bit with some of these other effects and these other stylized collections. We'll come down to this Van Dyke brown for fun. Isn't that nice? You know, one click. They've done a, They really have done a wonderful job of creating some instant looks that are pretty, pretty darn nice right out of the box. And we can come down here and, and go to other things. We're going to see what the coffee looks like. A little bit too dark. We can see what camel looks like, and we work with that. Let's, let's stay with that and then come on over here to the um, creative effects. And we can click on this diffusion. It looks a little bit overdone to me. So we can come in here and dial that down just a little bit, bring the, uh, the softness of that, and bring the diffusion down a little bit. And by the way, just a good time to just pause for a second. Uh, if you were part of the, the last webinar I did, we talked about how do you use Photoshop to help you do even more than what the, the plugins that Topaz is uh, giving you to work with. And so I would create a duplicate layer first before I sort of started working in the black and white effects piece of software. And that way I could do all of these adjustments. And for instance, let's say I wanted to make sure that her eyes and her mouth stayed sharp. I would be able to then put a layer mask into that uh, duplicate layer and then paint out with a brush, right, in the, in the layer mask, those areas where this was affected and, and make sure to keep her eyes sharp. Um, just so those are some things that we can do with our normal uh, tricks that we're doing in Photoshop. Okay, let me get back on track and uh, we can go down here if we want to and add that transparency in and add a little bit of color back in of that cute little pink shirt that she's wearing. And if we wanted to add more of that in, look what we can do. We can go back to this local adjustment. I went to tab number three, rolled that down. And now if I go over to color, it's going to allow me to paint on this shirt and bring back some of that color. Let me bring that opacity up just a little bit. There we go. And notice it's doing a real good job of just selecting that shirt. I'll let it catch up here. It's done a good job of going just to the edge of her shirt and bringing back just the pink shirt. I'll go right to the edges here. And as I like to say when I teach software stuff, you know, forgive me for not doing a great job of painting. I'm not a professional painter uh, with, a, with the mouse here as I'm doing these, but I, if I'm doing these images uh, at home and working on them for myself, I would be using my Wacom tablet and doing a much finer job. We're just trying to give you some ideas about the capabilities and uh, what you can and can't do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust that you're going to do a much better job uh, getting those edges and playing with these sliders and the edge of where to make sure that's what you do. So there we go. It's, it's a very powerful piece of software for working on portrait type images. And we have all sorts of creative choices that we can use with that. All right, move on to the next one. We have a lot of images to go through here. I want to make sure we get them all in. Let's do one more. This happens to be Marley's dad, uh, Dalen. So let's take a look at this one.
And I'm going to ask Nicole, how, I don't even know how to pronounce some of these things. This is opalotype? Yes. Am I even close? Yes, that's exactly what it is, opalotype. How about that? <laughs> Good. <laughs> it shows you how knowledgeable I am on some of these looks. Well, that's a All pretty, I know uh, is I liked it. It's, oh, it wasn't like super it. popular, so. <laughs> okay, so we're going to mm -hmm. go down there. And I just, I couldn't help, and I, and I hope Dalen, this big tough guy, is watching this. I couldn't help but choose hand-tinted chiffon. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was rather ironic uh, that that would work. Or hand-tinted cream, either one. I thought Dalen would really appreciate that that <laughs> was, was applied to him. And I'll be sure that if he's not watching this, that he, he learns of this he'll get a big kick out of it. Okay, so I, I, I chose that. But then over here, you know, I wasn't a big fan of the vignette that was put on there. I did like the tonality that was being done on there. So hopefully you're learning along with me as I can take out the film grain out of there. And I can take out the vignette if I want to. Now I think I like that a little better. And notice that that particular effect already put the trans, uh, transparency in there. I can kick that up a little more. And I think I like that a whole lot better. Um, so hopefully, we'll just pause here for a second. Hopefully, you're seeing that what's important, I think, and why I think this is such a home run of a piece of software is for those of you out there, and you know, and I find that there's varying degrees of of capability with software because not everybody has the time, like some someone like I do, to to work on images for hours in the day. You know, you're out working real jobs, and, and you come home, and you have families, and then you're going to spend a half an hour once a week working on images. And what I love about this is you have such great presets on the left side, and you can create your own presets, by the way. So if you create a look that you like, like I have here, I can save that and, and call it a name, and it'll be available for me to apply the next time I do a similar type of photograph. So I... That the first thing that I really love is how simple it is to use and how easy it is to, to get a really nice look very simply. But for those of you who have more time and are more interested in fine-tuning things and playing with the details, you have just almost unlimited control on the right-hand side to start to craft these things to be something very different than what even those wonderful presets are. And I think that's really important. Um, that you have both of those, and that's why I think, again, it's such a home run because it really is going to appeal to both of those or, or all levels of capability with processing because processing can be intimidating. I think this takes all the intimidation right out of the equation. Okay, let's move on. So the next thought here, and we'll go to Florence. We're going to, on a boat ride to Florence, no less. Okay, and let's just walk through the normal workflow. And, and again, at this point, what I'm just trying to, to point out to you, I think, is how am I using the piece of software at this time? We, it's going to be somewhat redundant and hopefully just introducing you to maybe ideas at this point that you can then apply to your images. So what do I do? Uh, I come over to this left-hand side, and I really start playing. And that is a little bit different than my normal workflow. And, so, and most, I like a, in, a, in a Topaz Adjust, I tend to go to the right side and start working with those sliders over there. But these presets really are, and I hate to be so redundant, but the presets really are so good that it, it's a lot of fun to come over here and start playing. You know, so come on down here to that warm tone. I think they've done a nice job with the warm tone filter. Some of these Van Dykes I really, really like. I think they create nice looks. Just like that, it's a beautiful, beautiful look there. Um, and they go on and on and on, and that's for you to explore. So let's stay there on this particular image. And actually, you know what? Let me go back because I want to follow my notes because I spent some time making sure these things would follow some pattern here. So I'll come back to the warm tone. There we go. And I'm going to come over to the right side, and I'm going to come over to the conversion. And I'm going to come over to this adaptive exposure on this one and show you that if you wanted to, you could start to add even more detail by using the detail slider. Not much. You don't want to get overdone on this. I'm going to quickly jump down to the finishing touches because, again, I'm not a big fan of the film grain right on this particular image. So that took that film grain out. 
Um, and then we can come down to the finishing touches again, and we can put a border on it. Again, you know, pretty simple right at the moment, but they're going to have more of those. And then we can come back up to the localized adjustment, because let's say we're looking in the bottom right corner, and we feel like maybe that's a little darker than we'd like it. So I'm going to make my brush a little bit bigger here. Uh, overall strength somewhere around here. And I'm going to start painting in this little area and brightening up that bottom corner just a little bit. And you should see that mask that's creating down here. Uh, and there's the mask, and that's showing you where you're painting uh, in this area. And so here's your, oh, by the way, in the top left corner, I forgot to point that out, is where you can see the original versus the uh, final, uh, or, or where he had, I should say. And so you can kind of flip back and forth and, and see how you're doing compared to what you started with. So once again, we used a preset here. We turned off the, um, the film grain because I wasn't a fan. We added a border. We did some selective adjustment. And then if you want to, and come down to my favorite, because I just love this little feature of the transparency. You can bring this over and add a little bit of that color and give it sort of an old world feel with just a little bit of that added back in. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is an HDR image, you know, hopefully kind of a subtle HDR image in an old abandoned building in Maryland. And I just want to show you that here what we can do is we can create a very stylized look if we want to. We can come down to sepia. Let's go to tone collection. And we can come down to, let's say, something like sepia. And now we can definitely come over to... Uh, I'm sorry, conversion, and come to adaptive exposure, and now we can start to use these sliders like I was explaining before, much like we would in Topaz Adjust. I'll bring this over quite a bit and add the regions up quite a bit, and now we're really starting to make it look like a grungy faux HDR, even though it's a faux, uh, I mean, it's an HDR image to start with, where we're adding more of that HDR look right from within here. We can come down to the detail slider in this adaptive exposure, add even more detail, go way up on that, even boost up the details a little bit, and really start to get a very stylized black and white image or sepia image in this case. And why not? Let's go down to my new best friend <laughs> and even add some of that color back in. All right. Just great fun. Uh, so now you here. Let's just show you before and after on this one because I think this is kind of fun. So it started out as a you know not a bad image. Now we've added a whole bunch of stylized feel to it, and we're and we're having fun, as my buddy Tony Sweet says. Nobody you know it's it's not fattening. Nobody's getting hurt. We're having fun here. Okay, I think one last one. I'm just going to keep an eye on my time here. Uh, one last one, and this is the one last feature that's really important uh, to point out because I think it's a, it's a differentiating feature uh, that Topaz has added. So let's go down to this, and let's start by choosing the Van Dyke. And again, let's go through this a little slowly so that it makes sense because I think this is really important in the, for you to understand. Remember, when we hit a preset on the left side, it is just basically making the adjustments on the right side for you, and then you can go to those adjustments and tweak those. So in this case, I think I chose the Van Dyke, and we'll go to coffee on purpose here. We're making this pretty dark on purpose because I want to be able to show you what's happening over here. Notice that the quad tone is, is checked. So that means it's using the quad tones to be able to create that look. So if we roll that open, we see the different regions, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and these are on the scale of from 0 to 255. And they've already put these in for you to, to create that. So this white and this color and the brown and the black are there for you. But here's the beauty of rolling this tab open, is you now have the ability to tweak this. So I can go to this region, and now what this slider is going to adjust is the lightness and darkness of that particular tonality. So watch, if I roll this to the left, 
it's going to make that brighter. So those, those black tones have just been made brighter. Like it'll be even more dramatic here. If I roll this brown tone down, look at that. We've brightened it up significantly. So we can take something, hopefully what you're, you're visualizing here is, we can take an image where we, man, I really like that coffee or raw umber, but man, it's just making it a little bit too blocked up in the shadows. Hopefully what you're realizing here is that that's not going to be a big worry to you anymore because you're going to be able to come in here and keep that look of the tonality uh, that it's creating with that particular preset. And now you're going to be able to come into the quad tone and adjust it. And here we can even make the brights a little brighter. So this region number four is affecting the whites or the real bright tonalities. So if I roll this to the left, it's going to make those even brighter. And so if you notice the referee's shirt got a lot brighter. Some of those lights and highlights got up in there a lot brighter. You need to be careful not to overdo it. But the reason this becomes important in crafting your image is because, remember, we talked about this early on in this session, if we have bright brights and dark and darks, that's when we really get an image that pops, that's visually much more appealing you know, when we're working in, in uh, black and white or sepia or, or toned images. So this is allowing us to really fine tune uh, with these sliders that look. There we go. We made it even brighter and noticed how that popped by bringing region three down just a little bit. I'm going to bring it down a little bit more to make it even more dramatic. So. Just the review on the left side is those presets, and in this case, if it's using a quad tone, I would encourage you to open that up and then fine tune what that particular preset is giving you, especially in these quad tone sliders, and lighten and darken those particular regions that you're feeling aren't being affected properly. After all, it is a preset. It doesn't know exactly what you want it to do but it's giving you a pretty good starting point, point, and I think that's how you should look at it. It's a, it's a beginning place. The preset is a, somewhere where I can jump off and think about what I want to do or get an idea that, hey, I, I really like that tone. I hope when I go into the quad tones, I'm going to be able to lighten and darken some areas and really fine-tune and craft this to be what I want. And I think, uh, Nicole, that's all I have for this particular session. I, I don't want to overdo it and, and lose people. No, that's great. Um, so if you want to open up the questions at this point, you can do that. I'll Absolutely. Start. If you have any questions, you can type them into your questions module now, and I will see how many John can answer <laughs> in the time left over. So over the next 20 minutes, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Can you um, possibly show them how to save a preset of your own while sure. I look at some other questions? Yep, absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, let's open up what we did. Oops. Okay. So if we did this, we came over here, and we added some transparency back in there, and we went to our quad tones, and we did some lightening of some things, and we'll stop there. We can go down to the bottom left corner of the screen. I'm way in the bottom left over near where it says menu. It says save. That's all we have to do. So we name the preset. Obviously, it puts our name in there automatically. We can put it in the particular category and what it's good for, uh, add other things if we want to, and then it makes good sense to put a good description on there, folks. I can't tell you how many of these I've created, and I'm like, what did I use that for again? So uh, you know, make sure to put a nice description, and then we'll hit OK, and then it'll drop it right in the left side. You'll see it on the left side, and you can go choose it there. But that's, that's how you create your own uh, preset with the Save button in the bottom left, left side. Yes. All right. And um, I actually want to address a question from Kevin. He says, is quad tone adjustments, or in quad tone adjustments, are the four tones dependent on the image chosen, and will they be different when each photo is brought in? And if you don't mind, I'll just quickly answer yeah, that. Yeah, go ahead on that. Sure. Kevin, when you bring in your original photo, those quad tones are actually at a default setting. So unless you choose a preset that uses the quad tone, it won't be applied to your image. So the, the tones within that quad tone feature are actually coming from a preset that you choose or 
they're actually going to be, you can hand pick them by clicking those tones open and, and getting your own color. But just because you bring in an image doesn't change those tones at all. For instance, typically uh, you should be able to go to the finishing touches, go to the quad tones, because I know I've done it before. There it yeah, is. There you you go. Had to open, and then now you can actually pick other colors, but it's, it's going to look a little goofy. <laughs> Right, so uh, my experience so far is to go ahead and use what Topaz has created for that particular look and then adjust those sliders within the regions. All right, so we have some uh, kind of questions for you and what you look for in a black and white image and whether it's different whether there are different things that you look for in a color photo, you know, what makes a good black and white versus a color? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And what makes a good, um, believe it or not, a good color photograph, so a couple thoughts on that. First of all, something that has a wide range of color tonalities are going to give you a wider range of black and white tonalities. And so sometimes you might do an all green scene of, you know, summertime, and it might might not translate to um, black and white quite as well because you have the same common tonality throughout it. So having different varying tonalities through it, throughout it will help uh, differentiate that. And obviously if there's reds and blues, you know, a blue sky will convert with the proper filter to really a nice dark black, for instance, versus a gray sky is going to remain somewhat gray. Um, and hopefully that helps a little bit with choosing what a good black and white subject might be. All right. Could you explain the silver and paper tone toner? Okay, so I'm going to let Nicole explain those because those get a little confusing to me. Here, let me open it up. Nicole. Okay. Yeah, um, Andrea asked that, and Andrea, that's more of a duotone effect. The silver tone is going to affect the darker or or um, shadow tones within your image and then the paper tone is going to affect the lighter or white tones in your image simulating actually what paper um, would be in a, in a wet darkroom setting. So you're able to pick the hue, you're able to do the individual strength and then you're able to put the overall tonal strength up or down to, to really push that tone and then the balance actually takes it from one silver tone versus paper tone which one is brought out more within your image so you have a lot of controls there but basically it is it's how the cool tone effect and the warm tone effect within the traditional collection were created because you can get some more subtle tones that are more uh, towards paper itself and printing itself, I guess you could say. And then the quad tone has been used to really get the more authentic historic processes that, that have more than just two tones. So I hope that helps. That helped me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Uh, do you have certain papers when you're actually printing, John, that you prefer to print on black and white for black and white images or... Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Hanna Mule papers, and uh, I've used anything from their photo rag to torsion, but then there's actually, uh, there's great new metallic papers, and, you know, if you really want something to pop and have that, you know, almost it jumps off the, the paper type of pop, some of these new metallic papers, and I'm absolutely mental blanking. I, I have a gentleman who does most of my printing for me, and he does a great job, and I cannot remember for the life of me the, uh, I want, almost want to say it's Ilford, but uh, there's a paper that he introduced me to uh, that I think is just tremendous for black and white, and I, I apologize for absolutely having a mental blank. I really want to say it's Il an Ilford paper, but I could be wrong. Okay, thanks. I have couple people writing in metallic Red River or Moab Slick Rock. Yeah, the Red <laughs> River makes great papers, really great for archival. And Moab is another good company. There's a lot of great companies out there. I have used all of those. I, I, I just tend to, you know, some of the, the satin papers from Hanna Mule, it's just an area. It's, it's probably one of those creature of habit things. I've used mm -hmm. 
uh, the Hanamule papers for years, and so I tend to, to gravitate towards those. There's a pearl and the satin and that I've used, and the photo rag tends to be actually, I, I'll correct myself, that's more for some of the floral type things that I do, and the black and white is going to be more of the pearl and the satin type finishes. Okay. And um, while we're on the printing subject, people are writing in a few questions, so this is definitely something that, that interests them. Um, anything special to consider with respect to printing black and white images versus color? Or are you? Yeah, no, I, I think to me the same things apply. Uh, and again, you'll, you'll, know real, you'll learn really quickly that I've chosen personally uh, to rely on someone who, to do my printing because I just didn't want to take the time to really dig deep into that. I wanted to spend my time crafting images out in the field, and then I, don't, and I really enjoy the Photoshop side of the world. So all I know is when I'm preparing any image, I want to make sure that I've got a good solid black point set, whether it's color or black and white, mm -hmm. because that's what's going to create that contrast and that pop, if you will. And then making sure the white point in, in, in a black and white photograph is set properly so that we have that range, uh, the contrast range, and again, making it have some vibrancy and have that ability, I keep using that word pop, but pop off the page, jump off the page at you. Uh, there is a little trick I do use once in a while on the Photoshop side. If I feel like it still is a tad flat, that it still doesn't have that contrast pop, if you will, to kind of leap off the paper, if you use your unsharp mask tool within Photoshop and you set the values at 20, 50, 0, that's, it's really not a sharpening move at that point. It's really what we call a mid-tone contrast move. The only thing you got to be careful of when you do that is if you've already got some bright tonalities, whites, for instance, that are already pretty close to being blown out, but they're not blown out. When you do that 20-50-0, it may blow those out. So just be very mindful that it might make it look really good through 90% of that image and just take away that last little bit of uh, flat feeling you're having about it and just be the, the, the thing you really needed. But if it does possibly blow out those bright tones that are in that image, again, I would put a duplicate layer. Once I learned that it did that, I would duplicate the layer. I would go ahead and do that 20-50-0 move to give it that final contrast punch that I was looking for, and then just use a layer mask and just paint out or protect, if you will in this case, those bright areas that were getting blown out. That's a technique that I've used. All right. Um, I want to just address a few questions that are coming through, or, or many questions. Uh, we do have infrared presets in our stylized collection, so you can uh, check those out. They work for some images, some images they don't, so it's really, um, really how, what image works with which one, so you can check those out. And John is actually demoing that right now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, John, I know you're pretty new to the program, uh, you know, yourself, since it's just out, and right. I have a few people wanting to know what are your favorite effects so far, or what are your um, what, favorite things about the program so far, including your favorite effects? Yeah, the favorite, I mean, I, I tend to find myself going through a lot of these, uh, the traditional, because I think I like the traditional uh, look better. <clears throat> Uh, and then in the toned, I've played with the sepias because I tend to like the sepias. Uh, but the stylized, I've spent a lot more time than I ever thought I would have there, and specifically with this diffusion, diffusion with color. I just, look at that, even just clicking them on this particular image, I just think it's wonderful. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good look. So <clears throat> as far as some of the presets that I'm really drawn to, that's where I'm drawn. And in this particular image, actually, the infrareds look really great. Uh, that's a nice choice, and that's what I'm clicking on right now. Um, and then I think that's pretty much where I've lived here. And then if I had to pick the Van Dyke Brown collection is what I really like as far as some of the more stylized ones. But I think I covered already what I really like about, if, if they're asking also, I think I, the other question was, what do I like most about the piece of software? And mm -hmm. I like that it really covers a broad range of, processing skill. You can just go and play to your heart's content on the left side, and I guarantee you, you're going to find something that you like. 
it, you're, you're going to click on one and you're going to like it and you're going to be done <laughs> if that's the kind of time you have. But then for me, because I like to play on the right side of this thing, I mean, I just love the creative effects that I can put in specifically diffusion. That's where I played mostly. And then in the finishing touches, now that I understand this quad tone better, I use that a lot. And then I really love this transparency because I like the ability to add back in uh, some of the color that was in that image because I, I just like that particular look. All right. So thank you, John, so much. I really appreciate you being our first pro to show how you're working with black and white effects. I think you well, showed a lot of that. Uh, again, thanks for having me along. It, it really is a lot of fun. I think it's a big home run, and I'm glad to come back and, and hopefully you know, show some folks some ideas. And I can't wait to see all the images that are going to be floating all over Facebook coming up here. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see them either. Thanks again. And everybody have a great, safe day or night or morning, wherever you are. If you have any questions, you can contact me uh, personally. My name is Nicole. You can contact me at webinars at topazlabs.com. And if you want to sign up for any upcoming webinars, we have another pro webinar coming up next week, as well as some other webinars um, the rest of this week, uh, or in the rest of the month, excuse me. You can sign up at topazlabs.com slash webinars. Thanks again, John. Have a good day. <laughs> See ya. Bye.